All right, everybody. Well, my uh, my file sharing um, service is not working. Dropbox is, appears to be down for some reason. So we're going to go analog today. Uh, we'll just do whiteboard, um, which which works. Um, this is not one that depends that heavily on on um, having you know perfect figures and whatnot. Um, so today, if you if everything to this point has been prim primarily review, this is going to be one of our first big new topics. Um, and this is a topic that if, when you take the Gen Chem series, the three quarter long series, you spend like close to six weeks on this topic um, because it really applies to everything. It's one that we I've kind of been setting it setting up for a while. We talk about how reactions never go all the way to completion. Um, basically, what we're going to talk about today is the idea of uh, equilibrium in more detail. Um, and, and specifically, we call it, it's, it's a dynamic equilibrium, right? Does anybody remember what dynamic equilibrium means? Yeah. What? It's when um, there's still change happening, but it doesn't affect like actual results. I don't know. How to... You're close. Yeah. There's, there's no net change happening. Mm -hmm. Stuff is still happening. Events are still happening. Things are still moving, but there's no net change. So... In other words, if you have a reaction, um, A plus B goes to C, if it's happening in the same speed forward and backward, we call that at, e at dynamic equilibrium because it looks like nothing is changing from at the macroscopic level. But stuff is still moving around because everything is constantly moving around. So... What we're going to look at today is, is basically turns out that we can actually predict the rate of these reactions. Um, and that's, that's something that mathematically requires calculus to, to explain really well. Um, so we're not going to spend, calc is not a prereq for the, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on the calculus side of things. Um, but basically we can say that there's, if there's a reaction happening forward, in a reaction happening backward, each of those reactions has their own rate. And the rate of the forward reaction is generally has a form that looks like this, where you get a constant times your concentration of your two reactants. And the rate of the reaction depends on these two concentrations because you need these two things to run into each other for something to happen. If you need A plus B go, um, to run into each other to make it to C, then increasing your concentration of A or of B is going to increase your rate, which kind of makes sense. Um, and then this K is just is what we call the rate constant. It's basically every reaction is going to have its own rate constant that's based on um, that's based on the temperature, is based on how how likely these two compounds are to run into each other like, with the right orientation so that something can happen. Um, well, if there's a reverse reaction, it's gonna look pretty similar, right? Except it's gonna be, we're gonna say it's the reverse rate is gonna be equal to a different K so we'll call it K minus one since it's going backwards. And what concentrations are going to affect the reverse rate? Just C, right? More C we have, the faster the reverse reaction happens. So we can kind of see why this, why a system would eventually reach equilibrium because as you, as, um, the forward reaction happens, you start running out of A and B, right? So the reaction starts slowing down in the forward direction. And at the same time, you're making more product, more C, which means the reverse reaction starts speeding up. And so there's always going to be a sort of a crossover point 
not really a crossover point there. It's an equilibrium point where these two rates are the same. And so the way we, we define that, if these two rates are the same, what can we do algebraically? We can set them equal to each other, yeah. So we can say at equilibrium, the forward reaction, the reverse reaction are equal. So we can see, say K minus one times C is equal to K times A times Doesn't necessarily seem all that useful yet. But where this really becomes something useful is if we, if we group all of the concentrations together and all of the K values together because that's gonna allow us to rewrite this in a way so we can say concentration of C divided by concentration of A times concentration of B is equal to K over K minus one, which we just, those are both constants, right? So we usually just combine those and we write it as capital K. Um, and sometimes we have that written as KEQ for equilibrium. What this means is that for every chemical reaction, we can predict when the, it's going to reach equilibrium if we know this equilibrium constant. And we can figure out what these concentrations are. Or vice versa, we know that if we know the concentrations at equilibrium, then we can figure out what the equilibrium constant is. So basically this is gonna be a way that allows us to predict where the reaction is gonna stop. Instead of just using stoichiometry to say, assuming that we're gonna get 100% yield for our theoretical yield, this is a much more accurate way to think about things. No reaction actually goes to completion. Every reaction has some point where you get this ratio of products over reactants. And this ratio of products over reactants is always equal to the same constant. All right, so this, this leads to, to what I refer to as the first rule of equilibrium. First rule of equilibrium, so you don't talk about equilibrium. No, the first rule of equilibrium is products over reactants. Always, for any reaction that happens, the equilibrium constant, what we call the equilibrium expression, when I say equilibrium expression, I just mean writing out this. For any reaction, as long as you have a balance, you can write out the equilibrium expression, and the first rule of equilibrium is products over reactants. And to emphasize how important that is, the second rule of equilibrium is products over reactants. Still, products over reactants, always. The very first thing you think, just like when we're doing stoichiometry problems, the very first thing you do is balance and then find moles. Very first thing you should be thinking when it comes to equilibrium is products over reactants. All right, because all this equilibrium expression really is it's just a ratio of products to reactants when the reaction stops, right? So you, if you have a value for K, you can actually use that for, to estimate you know, how, how much is this reaction going to go to completion? As, so for instance, if we had some, something like this and we said K for this reaction is 7.0 times 10 to the sixth. This is going to be one of those, good luck guys. Um, this is going to be one of those um, reactions or one of those expressions where we can be, get really, really big numbers. We're get, where scientific notation winds up being really, really useful. But just looking at this in general, if we say K for this reaction is seven times 10 to the six, is this a reaction that's where we're going to add equilibrium or we're going to have more products or more reactants? Why? 
because it's big. And what's the first rule of equilibrium? Products over reactants. If K is really big, it means the top half of this fraction is way bigger than the bottom half of this fraction. Right, the numerator is much bigger than the denominator. So if we have, in certain cases, if K is big enough, that's when it, we wind up making the assumption, okay, we're gonna, we know it's really an equilibrium reaction, but we're, we're gonna treat it like it's just stoichiometry because within sig figs, it's gonna go to completion. But a lot of times we'll have K values that aren't quite so big. And sometimes we'll have K values that are exceptionally small. Um, does anybody remember what the K value that we used for uh, auto ionization of water? called it KW, and it was 1.0 times 10 to the, it's where, remember we used the pH scale, or where the pH scale came from, kind of. 14, 10 to the minus 14. And that's for this reaction, H2O liquid plus H2O liquid. makes hydronium plus hydroxide. So 10 to the minus 14 is not a very large number, right? In fact, it could be argued it's a pretty small number. What does that tell us about equilibrium here? Are we gonna have more products or more reactants? More reactants. Much more of our reactant is going to stay as water than turn into hydronium and hydroxide. At equilibrium, we'll only have, in, if it's neutral water, we'll have 10 to the minus seven moles per liter of hydronium and 10 to the minus seven moles per liter of hydroxide. Let me, even if I can't put the slides up, I'm going to look at them, make sure I'm not missing something. They're steering us the wrong direction here. Use them as my lecture notes real quick. All right. So if we have, maybe let's take this. Why would we do that? Uh, oh, I know. Yep. That's so work. On oh, canvas is still working. Beautiful. This is just going to be way easier than me rewriting out all the practice problems. Give me a second to pull up the slides. This way. It only took me about 20 minutes thinking about it, letting it marinate before that occurred to me. All right, so here's just more, more figures showing um, some more background info on how these, these reactions can happen forward and backward. Um, we've talked about a little bit about energy and reactions, right? Um, about how things generally tend to move to be more downhill in energy, things that are more stable tend is kind of just the way the universe behaves. Does that sound familiar? We were talking about delta, delta H values. And we said reactions that are exothermic tend to be favorable. Is this ringing a bell? Yeah. Um, and so a lot of times we represent that with these potential energy surfaces where we have energy versus reaction. We say, okay, well, here's my reactants. They have this much energy. My products have that much energy. This difference in energy is kind of what gives rise to equilibrium. Um, and basically as the reaction's happening forward, as you're going from high ener higher energy to lower energy, you can still have the reaction happening backwards at the same time, right? 
but it's going to be happening slower at first because you're going uphill in energy. Your molecules are less likely to have enough energy to go backwards if they have to go over a bigger barrier to get there. But given enough time, if the reaction progresses far enough so that you have a lot more product, then that increase in the concentration winds up taking over. Um, a note about these arrows. Um, when we're talking about equilibrium, just like with everything else, chemists can get a little bit picky about their notation. Um, when we write a reaction arrow like this, this means we're assuming it's going to go to completion. We're assuming that, that we're, we could just use stoichiometry. If we write forward arrow and a backward arrow, sometimes written like this, that means it's, we're going to treat it like it's an equilibrium reaction. What you can't do is write an arrow like that. For reasons that will become clear when we get into organic chemistry, or when you take organic chemistry, that means a totally different thing. So e these both mean equilibrium. Just a single arrow means stoichiometry. This means a resonance structure is happening. It means that we're actually doing something totally different, averaging out orbitals. Um, and it's it's something that we're, we haven't gotten into really. So just as, as a note, it, and it doesn't matter which one's on top. That, that part, we're not that picky about. Um, you can find this typographical symbol where the forward arrow is on bottom or where the forward arrow is on top. That part doesn't matter. She actually looked up to see if there is some difference. Maybe there's, maybe there's more chemistry arrows. I don't even know. That's a good question. All right. Going through that same derivation I did on the board, where we looked at our equilibrium constants, capital K. One thing we didn't quite talk about yet is what do we do if there's coefficients for our balanced reaction? So for this reaction, for N2O4 reacting to make two nitrogen dioxides, when we write the equilibrium expression, whatever the coefficient is, is gonna show up as an exponent on that concentration. So in this case, what's the first rule of equilibrium? Products over reactants. So our product is the nitrogen dioxide. Because it has a two in front of it, in the balanced reaction, it's going to be squared in our equilibrium expression. Whatever the coefficient is, if it's a three, then there's a three in your exponent. If it's a 10, there's a 10 in your exponent, right? And then, and if it's just a one, then your exponent is a one. All right, so here's our generic form, which is actually almost more scary looking, a real example. If we have some theoretical reaction where we just use A's, B's, C's, and D's to represent just anything, if it's an equilibrium process, Our equilibrium expression is always products over reactants to the right power. So concentration of C to C, concentration of D to the lowercase d. And if there were more, if it was one of those reactions that has four reactants, you would have four terms on the bottom. Right, it's it's the same process. It doesn't matter how big the reaction is, as long as it's balanced, you can write the equilibrium expression. 
let's practice. We have three reactions here. Let's write the equilibrium expression for each one. So this reaction A, does anybody know what O3 is called as a molecule? It's a term you've heard before. I can just about guarantee it. It's another only oxygen-based molecule that's supposed to be found in the upper atmosphere, but was missing while it was being depleted by CFCs. Ozone, O3, without a charge, is more commonly known as ozone. And when you have ozone, it spontaneously will degrade into oxygen gas. What is the equilibrium expression here? Products over reactants, right? O2 is our product. To the what power? Oxygen to the third power divided by ozone squared. How about the next one? The next one has some more terms to it, but same process, right? Products over reactants. So that NOCL goes on top and squared because there's a coefficient of two. Nitrogen monoxide on bottom squared. Chlorine gas to what power for the chlorine gas? Just the one, right? Which means we don't even really need to write it because if we don't write an exponent, it's, we can assume it's to the one, right? Just like with coefficients on our balancing. So, so far, so good, right? Not too tricky. You just need to have a balanced reaction. If the reaction's not balanced when you get it, Balance it, and then you can write your equilibrium constant. So where does this start getting useful? Well, if we, if we have equilibrium concentrations, we can use those to figure out what K is for a reaction at a certain temperature. So for instance, this is a really common, um, really important agriculturally and industrially. The Haber process wound up being a really, really historical significance um, because this back before the Haber process was industrialized, before they were able to scale it up and, and perform it um, at scale, if you wanted to make ammonia, you actually had to mine ammonia from ammonium nitrate deposits in the ground. And ammonium nitrate is a really, really important chemical um, for synthetic fertilizers are mostly the nitrogen in, in synthetic fertilizers is all ammonium nitrate. But historically where it wound up being even more important um, is it's used in the production of gunpowder. Um, and in World War I, during World War I, that was really what led to the Haber process becoming a big deal because all of the countries in World War I were still had to get their ammonium nitrate from South Africa at the time was, I think it was in Chile in the Andes, was where the biggest ammonium nitrate mines in the world were at the time. Uh, so the, the German allied powers basically all got blockaded at the beginning of World War I. And everybody thought, cool, World War One's not going to be that big a deal because they're going to run out of explosives and because they can't get their ammonium nitrate uh, until Fritz Haber industrialized this process. And they were able to start making hydrogen gas by just using voltage on water 
and nitrogen gases in the atmosphere. So instead of being able to be not, not literally starved out, but figuratively starved out of gunpowder, they were able to start making their own gunpowder without shipping in ammonium nitrate from across the world. That's what allowed World War I to go on as long as it did. If it hadn't been for the Haber process, it would have been over very, very quickly. Um, and then it also wound up being really important because that allowed the industrial scale production of synthetic fertilizer. So it allowed, um, they call it the, shoot, the green, the green boom. No, uh, the green revolution, um, where they were able to basically just take land that otherwise was not able to, to grow crops on it anymore. And they were just able to just dump ammonium nitrate on it and turn it into really fertile ground, ground for a little bit until there were some other biological processes that got exhausted. Um, but so anyway, historical footnote, the Haber process is really important. And it's also a really good example of equilibrium because we have this balanced reaction and it's not a huge equilibrium constant. So at equilibrium, we actually wind up with pretty reasonable concentrations of everything. What is the equilibrium constant? What's the value for the equilibrium constant for this reaction? Well, if you're given nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia at equilibrium, start by writing your equilibrium expression and just plug in your numbers. So what's our equilibrium expression? What's the first rule of equilibrium? Products over reactants. Everybody's getting the hang of that one, right? So if we want a value for K and we have equilibrium concentrations, we just plug everything in. 0.72 molar squared over 0.1 molar times 0.2 molar cubed. So what do we get for our value for K? Point 0.7 squared is going to be something close to 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.2 times 0 0.2 is 0 0.04 times 0 0.2 is 0 0.008, 0 0.0008, multiplied by 0 0.1. We should get something in the hundreds range. What do we get for the value? Good practice for your exponent for using exponents too, right? In parentheses. Six hundred forty-eight. What are our units on this one? Molarity squared on top and molarity to the fourth on bottom. So one over molarity squared. Basically, I bring that up to, to let you know that um, with equilibrium constants, we're not going to pay too much attention to the units because one over molarity squared doesn't really mean anything, right? Um, and so the units don't inherently mean anything when we're talking about these. They will, we have to pay attention to them because um, in this case, all the all the equilibrium constants we've been looking at so far um, are, are actually more specifically Kc for concentration. But there's for gas phase reactions, there's also Kp, which means we're doing it in pressures. We haven't talked about gases yet, so we're not going to talk about pressures that much. Um, but all this just to say that as long as we're in moles per liter, we don't need to worry about K. Just keep everything in moles per liter 
when we're dealing with K. And we'll talk about atmospheres next week. All right, so how does this wind up being useful? Well, now that we know K, we can actually use it to predict how much product we should be able to make. So let's say we, we are trying to make our synthetic fertilizer and we're just gonna take some nitrogen and some hydrogen and we're gonna put them into a, to a container and let them react to make ammonia. And let's say we put in 1.00 molar nitrogen and 1.00 molar hydrogen. How much ammonia can we make? This is where math gets a little bit more interesting. If you've been bored with the math, because all we've really been doing is, is conversions over and over again, stoichiometry over and over, where we learned some new tricks. Have we dealt with ice tables in this class yet? All right, cool. We get to start from scratch with ice tables, which is great. Ice tables, I should rewrite K up here so I don't forget it. Ice, when we're talking about a chemical reaction, stands for initial change and end or equilibrium. So where this is going to get really useful is we know that at the end point, our equilibrium expression has to equal 648. We don't know how much product we're going to make yet, but we know how much of our reactants we're starting with and we're, we can assume if we're not given any amounts that we're going to start with zero moles per liter of our product. How much is our concentration of nitrogen going to change? Can we say yet? No. So what do we do if we if we know there's going to be a change but we don't know what the number is going to be? If you're doing algebra, let's call it X, bingo. And are we going to be gaining X or losing X? Losing, this is our reactant, right? So we're using up some of our nitrogen. So we're, we're just gonna say, we don't know what X is, we know we're losing some amount of X. How much hydrogen? are we going to use? Again, we can't say for sure yet, but what do we know about it? It's gonna be three times the amount of nitrogen we just used, right? So even though we don't know what X is, we know we're going to be losing some amount of hydrogen. And we know that the amount of hydrogen we're losing is three times the nitrogen that we're using because we have this one to three ratio, right? What can we say about the ammonia then? First off, is it plus or minus? Plus, it's the product. We know it's not gonna be X, it's not gonna be three X, it's gonna be, you could throw a Y in there, but as, the whole point of having this balanced reaction is that it allows us to say all of these are changing by the same, by some related amount, minus X, minus three X plus two X. We don't need to use a Y because that would introduce another variable. We don't need extra variables when we can do everything like this. So then for at this equilibrium row, all we're going to do is we're going to add up the row above it. So what's our equilibrium concentration of nitrogen? One minus X. What's our equilibrium concentration of hydrogen? One minus three X. We're gonna get sloppy with the sig figs for a minute so that we can do algebra with this because it's kind of, it'll save us a lot of space uh, in writing in this case. <clears throat> 
Then last but not least, what's our equilibrium concentration of ammonia? Zero plus two X, right? We didn't start with any product. So there was a zero here, not a one. All right, that's all well and good. I'm just gonna erase the zero since that's not really gonna make a difference. Let's come back over to K. What was our expression for K? What's the first rule? Products over reactants, right? So K equals concentration of ammonia squared over concentration of nitrogen times concentration of hydrogen cubed. <laughs> At equilibrium, we know what this ratio must be equal to. It must be equal to 648. So how do we figure out what these numbers are? We plug these in. We're gonna get a really nasty algebra expression, but one that we can solve. Because we have equilibrium concentration of nitrogen. It's not a number, it's an algebra expression, but we still have a value or a, a uh, expression for it. Right, so we can say, K is equal to 2X squared over 1 minus X times 1 minus 3X cubed. And as long as we're plugging things in, we can plug in our value for the equilibrium expression or constant. That doesn't look like a particularly fun expression to solve, but it's just algebra, right? Has anybody taken a class where they did the cubic version of the quadratic formula? It's really, really ma nasty, isn't it? Um, you could use that. Use in, in a lot of these expressions we're gonna wind up with, these equilibrium expressions, we'll wind up with some, with a quadratic where you could use the quadratic formula. Luckily for everybody here, this isn't math class as much as it feels like it sometimes. So I'm fine using a solver once we get here. Once you write it in and you set it up, you show me this substitution step, show me the ice table so I know where everything came from. It's a totally acceptable mathematical step in this class to say, I typed it into a solver. So what does that look like? Uh, my solver of choice is Wolfram Alpha. So we just pull up Wolfram Alpha, but there's uh, Desmos, there's the built-in solver on your calculator. Um, take your solver of choice if you've used, done any, any classes that use the solver, if not, Go to Wolfram Alpha. I'm not going to ask you a really nasty one to solve um, on, on a closed book test. The ones on the closed book test will have, there are some tricks that we can use to solve quadratics without actually using a quadratic equation. Um, but if it's a complicated one like this, we're just going to, you're always going to have access to a solver. <laughs> so, Typing that in, 648 equals 2x squared over parentheses, another parentheses, 1 minus x times 1 minus 3x. Well, for an awful likes it better if you do it like that. To the third, close parentheses. Tell it to solve for x. Then that, one of the reasons I like Wolfram Alpha is it then takes whatever you type in and it displays it mathematically the way we're used to looking at equations. So we can double check that it actually interpreted what we wanted properly. That looks like what we have written. Over. So we're, we're solid there. <clears throat> 
The problem with quadratics and cubics is that we get a bunch of answers. But luckily, we are, we're living in the real world, not in the math world now, and we don't care about most of these answers. Of these four possible answers, only one of them will make sense. We can eliminate the rest of them by just looking and seeing what's reasonable. Is it reasonable for x to be 1.0008? Could x be 1.008? Could x be anything more than 1? Why not? Because we can't have a final concentration that's negative. Right? So if we can't have a final concentration that's negative, that means x can't be anything that's more than 1. Really, actually, x can't be anything that's more than a third. And then the other options here. These two, do those look like things that exist in the real world? They even have that little eye to tell you that there's imaginary parts still. We don't want to deal with imaginary numbers right now. So anything with I in it, ignore it. It's not going to be any of the answers with I. And if you get two real answers, one of them won't make sense. It'll either be negative and it can't be negative. If we got a negative answer here, that would mean that we were that the reaction was going backwards and we started with zero here reaction can't go backwards if we start with a zero here right so same thing same logic as as before um only one of those answers should make sense so we get x equals 0 0.30228 we're not going to keep all those six things anyway Um, sometimes with roll frame alpha in particular, it'll default to giving you the exact answers, um, which again, we don't want to deal with that. So when you get something like that, just click on approximate forms. And if you need more digits, click more digits and it'll, and it'll expand them out for you. We don't need that many digits. So in this case, anyway, we started with only with our uncertainty in the hundredths place. So even though we got sloppy with our sig figs, we can assume that our answer is still going to have the uncertainty in the hundredths place because we're doing addition and subtraction, right? So what's our final concentration of ammonia? We did all that to solve for X, okay? Exactly. We can get our final concentration of all three of our compounds by just plugging in X. Our final concentration of ammonia is one minus 0 0.302, or about 0.7. Our final concentration of hydrogen is about 0.1. Our final concentration of ammonia is 2x, so 0 0.60. OK. Final. So just where our initial, I could have also said EQ fit for equilibrium. That probably would be a little bit more in line with the, the notation we're using today. Well, that's a lot more useful than just being able to do a theoretical yield. If we just use stoichiometry to get a theoretical yield, we're going to get a very different number. Right? We go through and say, what's my, our limiting reagent? What's our, and do our stoichiometry steps? This would be our limiting reagent, and it would wind up, we would wind up predicting that we'd get 0.67 moles per liter. It doesn't seem like it's off by that much. But then your percent yield is never going to be 100%, right? Our percent yield still won't be 100%. When we do percent yield, it's still going to be assuming that equilibrium doesn't exist. Assuming that we're going to go all the way to completion, which isn't the way the real world works, we now know. <laughs>
but this is why your percent yield will never be 100. Because every single reaction has an equilibrium component to it. In some reactions that are really, really downhill in energy, like combustion reactions, like combustion reactions, we don't usually treat them like they're equilibrium reactions. Um, combustion reactions, we can pretty much treat like they're, they're just going to be stoichiometry because their equilibrium constants are in the 10 to the 45 range. If you've got an equilibrium constant that's 10, this, this reaction went almost to completion just by having an equilibrium constant that was 650. If it was, if it was uh, 10 to the 45, then within sig figs, we can say, yeah, it's going to go to completion. We, we just know it's not technically true, but that's one of those, it's close enough situations. Um, another interesting point here, if the reaction can happen forward or backwards, does it matter if we start with the reactants or products? If instead we'd started with, uh, if we'd said, okay, we have 1.0 moles here. What really changes about that? we still are gonna to get to the same ratio of products to reactants at the end, right? So all that's really gonna change if we start with, with products instead of reactants, well, really that's just semantics. It just means that we're going from right to left instead of left to right. But mathematically, it's gonna be pretty much the same. If we're gonna fill out the same, do the same reaction, but backwards, how would we fill out our ice table? Well, I already did the I row for us. What happens for our C row? Let's start with the one over here. What is this going to be? It's still going to be two, and we can still use X. It's going to be a different X this time, but just use X because we're used to solving for X. And is it going to be a plus or a minus? Minus. Which means over here, this one one might actually wind up being a slightly, uh, only slightly easier one to solve. It's still going to be a cubic. Okay, so then at the end we'll have x three x one point oh minus two x. We're still going, and then we just plug it in just like we did before. Still write it as products minus reactants. It's a different algebra expression, but it's still equal to the same constant over here. So we're still just going to plug it into a solver to get x. What do we get for X in this case? One minus two X squared and X times three X. We got some more answers with I involved. So you can throw those out. Negative number we can throw out too, right? We know we can't be, X can't be negative in this case because we can't, can't have that reaction happen. So X is 0 0.079 or 0 080. Which 
is enough to fill out the rest of this, right? To actually get numbers for each of these. While we have this reaction up on the board, let's do one more. Let's say we started with 1.00 molar for everything. How does that complicate things? Or does it? Say it louder. It just means that we're going to have one plus for everything at the bottom. But how do we fill out our change? It's still going to be x, 3x, 2x. What's plus and what's minus, though? If we start with sum of everything, we don't necessarily know which way the reaction is going to go. But the nice thing about this is the math takes care of that for us. You can look at K and guess and say, okay, well, I'm starting with equal amounts of everything and K is greater than one. If K is greater than one, does that favor products or reactants? Products. So since we're starting with everything being even, we could guess that, okay, well, just based on K, I'm gonna go ahead and guess that this is plus X and make these minus. But just for the sake of, of argument, let's say we guessed wrong. Let's say we mixed up, mixed that up and we said minus X, minus three X plus X. So we get one minus X, one minus three X, one plus two X. So I, I rewrote that the exact same way, didn't I? <laughs> As long as you're consistent, the math takes care of itself. What we'll get is actually only one answer that makes sense, but it'll actually be a case where X is negative if we messed up a negative sign somewhere. I'll show you what I mean. So, so one minus, one minus, one minus three X, or wait, no, I have to be consistent. Plus, as long as you're consistent, which seems to be my struggle today. Well, so now both of these ones have an I in them, so we'll throw them out. Both of our real answers, though, are both negative, which just tells me that we messed up in. in sign when we did our ice tape. But as long as you're consistent, by which I mean, if it's plus on the reactant side, it has to be minus on the product side. Or if it's plus on the product side, it has to be minus on the reactant side. As long as you're consistent that way, the math takes care of itself. The way it's written here, we get X equals minus 0.276. Well, if we'd done the, equilib the um, signs properly, we would have gotten the same answer just with a plus. It doesn't really matter which way the reaction is going to go. You can always just plug it in, do the math, and get an answer. Why doesn't that one make sense? It's more than one, right? Which means if you do one plus a negative 1.07, you're going to get a negative concentration, which you can't have. You can never have a negative concentration. You can have a negative change in concentration, but the final concentration can never be negative. Right? At most, it would be zero. And actually what equilibrium is telling us is that even that's not true. Nothing will ever truly have a final concentration.
it might just be really, really close to zero if it's a tiny number. All right, so solvers are great. That seems to be the bullet point there, right? Ice tables, they're really, really useful ways of setting up a system of equations. All this really is, is we set up three equations with three unknowns, but we were able to do it with all with the same variable, which means we could immediately plug it in. We didn't actually have to write three different equations. We didn't have to write one plus X and one plus Y and one minus Z. And then say Y is equal to three X and Z is equal to minus two X. We didn't have to do that because the ice table and the balance reaction is basically a linear system of equations already. This is just a convenient way of keeping track of what's changing. And any time, sorry, I dropped the cap pen. Any time we've got more than one thing changing concentration at the same time, an ice table is a really good way to hold up to keep everything straight. Right, so it doesn't have to be used for equilibrium. Equilibrium is the most common place that you see it because you can't solve any of our equilibrium problems with no, without knowing everything's final concentration. But technically any stoichiometry problem, also you could use an ice table. If I had asked you an, a stoichiometry problem um, that just said, what's the final concentration of everything? You can still use an ice table to keep track of minus X plus two X minus three X, whatever. Right, it's just a way to do algebra. So with that in mind, let's talk about how we could actually solve some of these if we got a tricky problem and we didn't have a solver. If we don't have a solver, so we'll use one, since I'm going off the cuff here, um, we're going to use do an acid-base reaction with water. Not that one. And let's say we're doing this. Um, what's a good one? We'll do acetic acid. Because acetic acid is really common. Does anybody know what acetic acid is? Vinegar. And it's commonly used enough as a weak acid that I actually have its equilibrium cups are memorized. If we have acetic acid acting as an acid and we have water acting as the base. So this is just if you put acetic acid in water, this is what happens. What do you get? What's your conjugate base for the acetic acid? In other words, what's left over once your acetic acid gives up a proton? Acetate. Everybody remembers all their polyatomics, right? And what's the other product that we get? H3O. That's a relatively significant polyatomic ion when it comes to things like pH, right? I mean, Arguably, it's one of only two ions that matter if we're talking about pH. So knowing our final concentration of that is going to wind up being easy, um, pretty helpful. So when you first started learning about acids and pH, I said, OK, all the acids we're going to be dealing with are strong acids. And what did that mean? What does strong mean in that context? They dissolve completely in water. In other words, we can just use stoichiometry. We don't have to do equilibrium. A weak acid is anything that when you put it in water, doesn't dissociate 100%. In other words, where it's an equilibrium reaction. So weak acids wind up having their own sort of classification of, of um, equilibrium constants where we just say, okay, Ka just means your weak acid is reacting with water. Water is the base. It just saves us time because then we don't have to write this out for everything. We can just have a table of Ka values. And if it says Ka, that means reacts with water. 
So for acetic acid in water, Ka is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. What's our equilibrium expression for this reaction? What's the first rule of equilibrium? Products over reactants. So acetate times hydronium over concentration of the acetic acid concentration of liquid water have we ever dealt with concentration of water before can, can we have water dissolved in water in technically you can water has a concentration in itself if you have pure water the concentration of water in water is about 55 However, it's a constant. It doesn't change. If it's pure water we're talking about, or even water is a solvent, liquid water doesn't have a concentration that's going to affect anything because it's a constant, which leads us to the third rule of equilibrium. Liquids and solids don't count. Anything that has a constant concentration is not going to show up in your equilibrium expression. So basically, if you get a reaction that has a liquid or a solid in it, you just ignore it. If it's a constant concentration, there's no point in worrying about it changing concentration because it can't change concentration, right? So we're just going to leave it, ignore it. So if we want to know, let's say we want to know the pH of a, of a solution that is, uh, let's make the math more interesting, 1.25 molar acetic acid in water. As long as we know K, we can do this. Because how do we figure out the pH? What is pH? What do we need to get to pH? Hydronium concentration. So we're going to figure out what our equilibrium hydronium concentration is, and then all we have to do is take the negative log of it to get the pH. So if we're starting with acetic acid and water, based on normally I would write my ice table over here, but just because I've took up that space. I'm writing it where the water goes. Since we're ignoring water. What's our initial concentration of hydronium? Technically, it's 1 times 10 to the minus 7, but within sig figs, we can say it's 0. Never thought that sig figs were going to be helpful, did you? What's our initial concentration of acetate? Do we start with any product unless we're told otherwise? So what's our change? Start, go from left to right. Plus or minus? This is a reactant, so we're using it up. Products, what's our change here? Plus or minus? Plus, and how many X's? Just one. And how about hydronium? So that means we can come back over here and we can start plugging stuff in. This is actually looking like a much nicer equation to solve already, right? There's no cubed at least. 
when we start plugging these in, we're going to get x times x over 1.25 minus x equals 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. All well and good. If we have our solver, we're done basically, right? Type it into your solver, pick the right x value, and we can get x pretty easily. What do we do if we don't have access to a solver? You could do the quadratic equation by hand. It's not a particularly fun one. What is the size of this equilibrium constant? What does that tell us about products versus reactants? Products are gonna be small, right? If, if you're gonna make, if X is gonna be really small, what's our final concentration of acetic acid going to be close to? If X is really small, it's gonna be really close to the initial concentration, isn't it? So if our K, values are small enough. Here's another, it's valid in this class, but mathematicians don't like it, approach here. We can just say, assume X is close to zero. If X is close to zero, we're not gonna turn these ones into X because if we turned this into X, we just get zero. Zero equals K, that doesn't help us, right? But if we assume this one is zero, what happens? We get 1.8 times 10 to the minus five equals X squared over 1.25. That's a lot easier to see. No quadratic necessary now. We can solve for x the way we'd normally solve for x. So multiply both sides by 1.25, take the square root. What do we get for x? I get 4.7 times 10 to the minus three. Four point zero zero four seven. Is that assumption valid? What, how close is that? That's not the true X value, right? How close is it to the Wolfram alpha value? One point eight e minus five equals x squared over one point two five minus x. Approximate forms. Oh, would you look at that? Zero point zero four seven three. If you solve it that way, zero point zero four seven zero. I think. You might be off by the one in your last sig fig if you make this approach and it's appropriate. But for how easy it made it to solve that algebra expression, that was a valid assumption. The last step to showing your work, if you're gonna make this assumption, the way we test if it's a valid assumption, how far off can X be from the real value? Is basically, if you'd make this assumption when you solve for X, we test it by saying, is X less than 5% of what we started with? As long as X is less than 5% of our initial concentration, that's a valid assumption. So, and the way you can write that is, is X less than 0 0.05 times 
And as long as it's true, which it is in this case, 5% of 1.25 is 0 .0, 0 0.075, no, 0, 0.0 something though, maybe 0 0.0625. Either way, we're about 10 times smaller than that. So we can just write assumption valid, call it a day. On test, if I have you do an ice table and you wind up with um, solving for X, either it won't be a quadratic or your assumption will be valid, but you still have to show the work saying that you made the assumption that X was close to zero and then checking to see it was less than 5%. The threshold for weak acids is about 10 to one times 10 to the minus five. If K is bigger than, sorry, it's about one times 10 to the minus four. If K is one times 10 to the minus four, this assumption is not valid. X is too big. It's a significant chunk. So you can't assume that X is zero, but I'm not gonna do that to you on the test. A take home test maybe. We certainly couldn't make that assumption with the Haber process reaction we started with, right? because we wound up with significant amounts of everything at the end. But in this case, it is valid. So we'll practice more on that. It will be a quiz over the weekends um, on pH, probably not on equilibrium. Maybe just write out your equilibrium expression, not actually solving a nice table. Scott? So it's not, is X less than 5% of what you started? Yeah, like, if you have a solver on your calculator and you know how to use it, you can do that on the But since not everybody has a calculator that they have to have a solver on it, this is the only way to Concentration of hydroxide because then you could get PO of each. Remember doing that? Yeah. Okay. But calcium hydroxide makes it tricky because there's two hydroxides for every one calcium hydroxide.